How many times have you heard over the past, I don't know, eight years or so, buy gold, buy silver because the markets are going to crash. Buy non-perishable foods because of the next flood or earthquake or power outage or insurrection or virus. How many times have you heard that? It's like someone is throwing something at us all of the sudden, all of the time. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for that? <laughs> Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. Are you ready? Are you really ready for life as it comes at you in these days? Are you ready? Are you ready for the heroin addicted son or grandson? Are you ready for the death of a spouse at a young age or in your old age? Are you ready for the ramifications of your bad choices? that you keep making over and over again and the consequences. Are you ready for a job loss or a sickness? You say to me, Danny, well, good homes and good people, Christians don't have these problems. I don't expect things like this to happen to me. We're, we're fine. We got money and we have health insurance and we have a retirement pension, good job, friends in high places. Nah, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Or do you live as did the great leader Damocles, who pandered to Diocenes, his king, exclaimed to him that Diocenes was truly fortunate as a great man of power and authority, surrounded by all this magnificence, he told him. In response, Diocenes offered to switch places with Damocles so that Damocles could taste that very fortunate life firsthand. Damocles was quick and eager in accepting the king's proposal. So as Damocles sat down in the, the king's throne surrounded by opulence and luxury, Diocenes arranged that a huge sword hang above the throne, held by nothing more than a single hair of a horse's tail. Damocles finally begged the king that he be allowed to depart because he no longer wanted to be so fortunate, realizing that with great fortune and power comes trials and also great danger. The story epitomizes many times the eminent and ever-present reality of life, does it not? The writer of our text this morning, James, Jesus' brother and a leader in the Jerusalem church, outlines for us some general characteristics of the Christian life. He says this, he says, count it all joy, as Rich spoke. Count it all joy when troubles come your way. All joy, you ask? <laughs> all joy? Verse 3, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Christians don't, don't, do not have to be victims of their own circumstances but can have victory even in times of trial. My youngest brother, John, tells the story of his eight months in Montgomery County Prison. I would try to visit him every Thursday when he was there, and I remember reading this same James 1 text one day. Just as James attempted to do in preaching and teaching to these early believers, these thriving Jewish Christians in communities like Rome, Alexandria, Cyprus, and cities in Greece and Asia Minor who did not have the support of, a, of an established Christian church. 
but encouraging them in their faith during those difficult days. I, too, tried to bring this message to John in my own way. Today, John will tell you that the cold, dark, damp, and smelly prison that he never thought he would ever get close to in his life became the battleground and, thankfully, the bedrock of his faith. Today, he counts his experience as a convicted criminal involved in drugs as joy. James is not saying, friends, if trouble comes your way, but when trouble comes your way. He assumes that we will have troubles and that it is possible to actually profit from those troubles. Friends, this could be your prayer that you will start to live a life not pretending to be happy and okay when you face pain and trouble and sorrow, but to have a real positive outlook. It could be the only prayer that we'll ever pray. Considering it an opportunity for joy and for learning and growing closer to Jesus. The Apostle Paul wrote, That is why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults and hardships, persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I'm weak, Paul said, then I am strong. God's intention is not for us to be weak. God's intention is not for us to be passive or ineffective, but when the obstacles start to come, he wants us to rely on him alone and count them as perfecting tools for a lasting and fulfilled and valued life. Have you heard of the, the lettuce sermon? Learn this in seminary. Found in Hebrews 10, the words let us are found five times where the writer points out the significant privileges associated with our new life in Christ Jesus. This kind of text is called cohortative learning, where we're learning together through experience. It says, let us draw near to him. Let us, let us hold fast without wavering to hope in him. Let us think about ways of motivating each other. Let us not give up meeting together like this, like so many people today who don't go to church, haven't gone back to church. Hebrews 10 says, let us not give up meeting together, as some people do. Let us encourage one another in trials and in hard times. So he asked me, Danny, do you know my pain? Danny, do you know my story, my sorrow, my guilt, my shame, my situation? Do you know it? No, I don't. But Jesus might be asking you right now, right now, Joe, Julie, and Mary, you have followed me all this way, and you still don't trust me. James tells us no matter what the trials on the outside may bring, we can experience victory through faith in Christ. It was the summer of 1971. I was 15 years old. I'd just gotten home from catching a doubleheader on my summer American Legion team. Mom had made me something to eat. I, I talked to her briefly after eating, took a shower, and I just went to bed. I was exhausted. I was awakened, though my dad was out working that night. I was awakened that night by my mother crying downstairs. It was a, a sobbing type of cry that I had never heard before. I went downstairs to see my mom and noticed she had hundreds of, of black and white photographs of my dad and also pictures of my brother Jim and me out looking at them. 
I've told you my father died at the age of 33, 1957, of brain cancer. I was two years old. My brother Jim was seven. My mom was 28 when my dad died. I sat down and tried to comfort my mom as best a 15-year-old could do. She finally told me the real story of how daddy died, the fear she experienced as a young wife with two children, a new house, and a dying husband. She told me that when daddy got sick, she marched into the doctor's office at the VA hospital in Philadelphia and looked him in the eye and said, okay, doctor, give it to me straight. The doctor was stunned at my mom's ability to face this head on. (laughs) Mom said that she knew, she just knew from losing her dad at 16 years old herself that there will be storms in life. That it is when she put her Orthodox, Lutheran, and Presbyterian-based and inspired teaching and her love for Jesus to the test. Are you walking today among the the spiritually dead, or have you experienced resurrection in your life? As a father, and as you well know, it is hard to watch your children make poor choices, but you pray and teach them that you have raised them to realize that they will have trials and they will have setbacks but that Jesus came to overcome the world. Everything we do, every experience we undertake is rooted in the life of Jesus. Victory comes with trials, and it makes us strong. We cannot really know the depth of our character until we see how we react under pressure. Fourth and goal at the one, With the clock running down, I need six points waiting for the diagnosis, waiting for the outcome, the audit, the empty house. Several years ago, I was sitting at a traffic light on Neptune Avenue, a very busy street in Brooklyn, New York, when I was hit in the rear by a a small truck that just did not stop. After getting out of my car, stunned and a bit dazed, and also convincing the man driving the truck that hit me that it would not be a good idea for him to run away, NYPD was called. After the smoke cleared and we dealt with the scene and reporting of the accident, one of the NYPD officers noticed my lifetime FOP sticker and offered to Arrange, are you ready for this? Arrange a ride for me all the way back to Downingtown. (laughs) I told him I appreciated that offer, but I was going to drive my own car back home. He looked stunned. (laughs) He was shocked (laughs) at my decision because the car was so damaged in the rear, but the taillights still worked, (laughs) believe it or not. I drove this Toyota cheap plug there. I drove this Toyota all the way back to Downingtown and dropped it off at the 3D auto body where my insurance company had made previous arrangements. The guy at 3D said, not every car, Danny, on the road today could have endured a 40 mile an hour crash in the rear and then driven it 125 miles after being hit. The car withstood a blow, but it kept going. Also, my attitude stayed intact for some reason by the grace of God. And as I drove, stopped worrying about all the things that will not get done because of this accident, took my eyes off my circumstances and lived to tell you the story. But there are four As I alluded to this morning, there are four essentials for victory in trial. Number one, always consider. Always be open. Always consider. A joyful attitude, James says. 
Number two, know. Know that you will grow and turn your trials into triumph. Know. Be convinced. Number three, let. Let your will surrender. If you don't hear me say one more word in my tenure here at Glenmore Church, remember the word, surrender. Surrender. Ask him to help you solve your problems. Don't turn to this world for your answers. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is a great example of this truth. The faith and dignity she displayed when she realized what God had done for her is seen in her prayer of praise known as the Magnificat, found in Luke 1. And then finally, the fourth vestige is ask. A heart that wants to believe asks expecting God to hear our prayers, relying on him, and align our desires with his purposes. So do you come here today with divided loyalties? Then you're not convinced then that God's ways are best, and that includes struggles in this life. Divided loyalties treat the word of God like any human advice and retains the option, friends, to disobey it. I watched the rolling waves one night several years ago. Restless waves in Fort Lauderdale in a hotel I was in. And those restless waves reminded me at the time of my own life of corporate decisions, courts of law, my own creeping older age, sick and aging family members, frustration with the world affairs, restless. Waves were fiercely restless. Satan will try to divide our loyalties like nature affects the waves with the wind and the gravity and the tide, as James writes. So if you're tired of that life, as I was, start relying on the Lord Jesus to show you the best way to live. Ask him for wisdom and trust. And listen to me. Trust that he will give it to you. Trust that he will give you that wisdom then your decisions will be sure, right, solid, with the peace of mind that Christ gives and only he can give you. There's a military strategy as a part of psych ops training that teaches, take the mind, the body will follow. Take the mind, the body will follow. John Milton in his book, Paradise Lost, wrote, the mind is its own place and itself can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. The great Warren Risby, pastor and Bible teacher, made the observation that the trials of life are not all alike, he said. They're like multicolored yarn that the weaver uses to make a beautiful rug, he writes. God arranges and mixes the colors and the experiences of life together. The final product, he says, is a beautiful thing for his glory. <clears throat> so what can we learn from trials and setbacks, even despair? What can we learn? Well, we should first evaluate our goals and priorities, live for only things that matter most, live for things that matter the most. You see, if wealth and power and status mean nothing to God, then why do we attribute so much importance to them and so much honor to those that have them? Verse 10 and 11 say, And those that are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade away like the little flower in the field. The little flower droops and falls and its beauty fades away. Our values, folks, 
Our values determine our evaluation. If we live for the present and not the future, then trials in all shapes will make us bitter, not better. On September 22, 1967, the late V. Raymond Edmond, president of Wheaton College, had been ill but got up to give an address in the chapel even though he was not feeling well. He died while speaking on the subject entitled An Invitation to Visit a King. Earlier, he had written these words in his text. They took them all away, he wrote, my toys. Not one of them was left. They set me here, shorn, stripped of humblest joys, anguished, bereft. I wondered why. Ah, the years have flown. Unto my hand cling weaker, sadder ones who walk alone. I understand. I understand. God does not work in us without our consent. We must surrender our will to his this very day as we travail in this post-Easter season. I know what the word faith is, and I know it's a noun, but I want to make it a verb today for our purposes. So let's faith together. Let's faith together, fully anticipating the appearance and the emergence, the occurrence and the dawn of this Savior, Jesus Christ, that came to earth, lived among us, died on a cross for us, and resurrected for us so we could have greater joy in this life and in eternal life with him. Let's faith together to be giddy, to be alive and dancing in this season, saying, not if, not if, but when these trials come, Lord, I will not fear the night. That's our prayer. Let's face the music together. Give it to me straight, Doc. Give it to me straight. Ask God. I want a heart that believes. Each of our troubles is like a stepping stone. Blessed is the man or woman who perseveres under trials because when they have stood the test, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. The victory wreath given to an athlete. Not the crown, friends, of this world, but the Reward of eternal life. Let me close. All that, all that I have said, it can start today. That new life can start today with you accepting this Christ for yourself and surrendering to him that he now becomes Savior and Lord in your life. That you cast aside your sin your guilt, your doubt, and accept his holy and forever forgiveness. I said forever forgiveness. And you'll be able to handle the waves and the storms of this life. The rear end collision of a broken relationship. The prison cell of sin and shame. The fragility of riches and power. The diagnosis that could come and look like disaster. The empty house. Jesus says, be in my presence. Will you be there? Will you be there? The longer, the better. (laughs) What and who are you trusting in trials? We grow in trials. We grow when they come, not if, friends, but Christ.